Hey there, and welcome to Montessori 101, a series all about the magic of Montessori. We believe that every child deserves a Montessori education. I'm Aubrey Hargis. I'm David Hargis. Uh, you can find us at childoftheredwoods.com. That's our home on the web. Uh, and today we're kicking off a fun series about Montessori materials. And we're starting with, I think, probably the king of the materials. <laughs> uh, queen. The queen of the materials, <laughs> the pink tower. The pink tower. So presenting the pink tower. The pink tower is the probably the very first Montessori material that most parents encounter when you start looking up Montessori education. If you just Google Montessori, look in Google Images, no doubt you're going to encounter a pink tower or an icon of the mm -hmm. pink tower. Um, it's just that prevalent. It really is like the symbol of Montessori. It's kind of the unofficial symbol of Montessori. I don't know that Maria Montessori herself meant it to be the symbol, but yeah. it definitely is a classic and iconic piece of Montessori materials For that we sure. have today. Um, and it's also one of the, the very first materials that many parents invest in when they start thinking about adding some Montessori materials to their own homes. Um, so the question is, once you've got your pink tower, <laughs> you might be wondering, what do I do with this thing? You know, do I really need it? And like, this is an essential. Um, what's the best way to use it? Do we just start to play with it? Do I just let my child play with it along with their other sets of blocks? Is it something special that I need to reserve aside and present in a very specific way in order for my child to get the full benefits about it? So in this little live episode, we are going to actually discuss the benefits benefits of this gorgeous, absolutely essential Montessori <laughs> material. I put that in quotes because Montessori is affordable for everybody. You don't have to have the materials. But, you know, if we we're going to make a list of essentials, this, this guy would be on it. <laughs> Definitely. In fact, if you're curious right. what other essentials we would recommend, we actually have a list, a downloadable list. It's on childhoodredwoods.com slash free. And scroll down, you'll find a 21 essential Montessori uh, basics, including our friend, the Pink Tower. So let's talk about this. The Pink Tower yeah. is really neat. I'm going to pick it up a little bit of it here. So, yeah, so let's do some demystifying. Yeah, so this is just the top half there's five so that's the pink tower is a 10 cube a series of 10 cubes uh, each one is smaller than the next and they're all uniformly colored a very distinct pink the pink tower of course and they are meant to be stacked the largest is about a thousand centimeters cubed and the smallest is about one centimeter cubed and the only difference is the size um, the color is the same uh, for each cube. The, uh, the, uh, the None of them squeeze or shake. They're all made out of the same material, oh, wood. They're solid wood. A solid wood, mm -hmm. exactly. So qualities like weight, of course, will change because one is much, much tinier than the other or the largest to the smallest, but only by nature, right? Only because the object itself is so much smaller. Uh, and this is because we want children to focus their attention on specific things. We call this isolation of quality. And it's one of the essential concepts in Montessori education. Uh, the pink actually is pretty amazing. Uh, do you know why it's pink? Um, yeah, apparently Maria Montessori actually painted um, a bunch of different towers that were in this shape uh, and she had them around her classroom and let the children just, you know, go and use them. But apparently there was a green, a green <laughs> pink tower, a green tower, you know, other different <laughs> colors. Um, and what she decided was that children were just drawn to the pink. Um, and so that's why she just chose pink. Now she probably in, in reality, she probably had to pick a color when she was working with uh, materials makers, she actually worked with some, some wood uh, toy manufacturers or just like people who, what do you call people who work with wood? Carpen yeah. Carpenters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so she worked with some carpenters to produce some materials for other classrooms, other teachers to use with children in, in settings. And so I, I kind of assume she just had to pick a color for them to paint it. That's right. And so she just got to decide. And what she decided was, 
hmm, children really seem to be drawn to pink. So pink it is for this particular tower. Yeah, and what a fortuitous choice. I don't think it would be quite as magical if it was the green tower or the blue tower. <laughs> I mean, we use those colors in Montessori. The uh, colors can be uh, associated with different things. Pink can also be the color of South America, for example. Yep. But uh, in, our, or, um, in this context, pink is perhaps just a convenient color. It was one that the kids were drawn to. Uh, and even though it's more eye-catching, the important thing is that it's all the same color. That's that isolation of quality. So mm -hmm. what's important isn't that it's pink, although I think, again, that makes it iconic. It's that it's all the same color. Uh, this is part of the sensorial subject area. So at Child of the Redwoods, we've identified 10 subject areas that a, uh, a a child in the primary or the lower elementary, and I think I would argue probably all the way up, is going to focus on, you know, even adults, we focus on these 10 areas. And one of those areas is sensorial that's focused on children in the first plane mostly, although I think even adults and, and older kids uh, have sensorial needs. But this is a classic of the sensorial education. Sensorial just is the way that we help children explore the world through their five senses, uh, touch, taste, the weight of things, the sound. There's all kinds of different amazing lessons, including the pink tower. So the question I have is, why would we use a pink tower to as a sensorial object and not, let's say, geometry? Why would we use a pink tower as a, why is it classified in yes, the sensorial right. category why rather is, than in like math or, that's right. or geometry? Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> that's yeah, kind of a big question. So Maria Montessori felt like children were learning through their senses and they were actually making impressions of the world through their senses. Um, and so she started to think, you know, what are the ways, you know, that we could help children to explore the senses of taste and touch um, and the visual sense, mm -hmm. the sense of smell. Um, and so she she actually just was kind of looking in the, the um, at at the toys or, you know, that were around her trying to think, you know, which of these kind of in, seems to really hone in on certain sensory impressions. And then later on, when we do study geometry with the children, the, that initial sensory impression has kind of already been made. That's right. Um, so that's kind of a later, it's a little bit more abstract. Uh, the pink tower is among other sensorial materials, among some of the very first materials that we would introduce to a child in the Montessori classroom. Although, so it's not the material that you master and then move on to. You know, it would be something like you have a first impression with the visual sense. And it's primarily visual, even though obviously a lot of it is about touch and about um, you can you can say there are a lot of senses involved, right? We're looking at it, but it's not just visual. We're, we're able to feel the weight of it, the size, the shapes of the cubes. Um, but primarily, when we look at this particular material, we're thinking this is to help children with visual discrimination from largest to smallest. And then after having this kind of an impression in their minds, after really playing with this material and experiencing it, then we can go into more abstract concepts. So we can say, hey, you know, we've got this pink tower. We've been having this physical experience with it. Uh, and then we can start to teach geometrical concepts that That's are more right. abstract later on. So just because a child is introduced to this material when they're like two and a half or three, three and a half, whenever, you know, however old your child is when you first get a pink tower, um, this material is kind of a staple. So they would ideally be coming back to the pink tower to experience it in new and different ways. You know, they might, for example, use it to measure things. Mm -hmm. They might say, hey, this is about the size of this. The very tiniest cube. Or, cube. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we're actually they might measure it with a ruler, you know, and find out, you know, that it is exactly mathematically mm -hmm. um, cubed. Exactly. <laughs> they might so actually here we have that. for those of you who are watching here, you can see the, the this is the smallest and the second of the smallest and they're precise. Right. So it would be two of these and two across uh, four of these cubes. The smallest would make one of the larger ones. Mm -hmm. And that is the kind of uh, mathematical thinking. So. Remember that a child under the age of about six is still in the first plane of development, which means they're very sensorially oriented. They are going to go out and try and understand the world through touch, sound, taste, their senses, right? Maria uh, talked about the power of the hand and like this great, the power that the hand is to as an instructor, instruct, to instruct. Uh, and after they get 
through that first plane into the second plane, they go through this incredible change uh, in it's this journey to abstraction. And so they start applying what they've learned through the sensorial world to abstract concepts. So to the very littlest one, and what you're saying, a very, very small child might just look at the tower or uh, you know, poke around on it or feel the weight or the, how cold it is or warm it is, depending. And as they get older, they might start to make observations about how they stack or can you stack a little one on top of a bigger one and mm -hmm. will it balance? without necessarily understanding these concepts of balance or whatever. But at some point, they're going to start to make connections like there really are four little cubes and one bigger cube. And that then will aid them on that journey to abstract thinking as they imagine things like ratio uh, or geometry. So as a for, uh, for a fact, we teach geometry mostly to older students. There is a little bit of geometry or introduction to geometry in the six to nine curriculum. Uh, well, but, there is in the primary as well. But where but, is it held? A but, lot it of, is, but it is primarily through a sensorial exactly. yeah, so, experience. So this is the gateway, right? Are you teaching your child geometry? You are. This is one of the things that we would do with something like the Pink Tower. We just don't call it geometry per se. We refer to it as a sensorial because the child's readiness and level is through the sensorial thing. And so we're designing equipment and using the, that equipment that feeds that part of their brain. Isn't it amazing? Look at it. The largest to the smallest, just uh, looking at them and knowing that if you put the whole stack together, they gradually get smaller like a tree, right? Mm -hmm. Like a Christmas tree uh, uh, or a cone or something. Uh, but if you just cut the middle out and just do the smallest to the tiniest, it looks amazing. These are the kinds of discoveries a young child would be making the weight. This is so heavy, this large block. And this one is so tiny. It's like the tiniest little feather. And yet, as I am concretely understanding and the more abstractly, mm -hmm. I'm realizing like this little tiny thing is exactly the same, this great big thing. Just there are more of them yeah, or the how, weight is it bigger. It might make you wonder how many of those little things exactly. would fit into that big thing. That's right. How would I? And then now this leads you to discussions of things like area or uh, other geometric and uh, mathematical concepts, mm -hmm. as well as uh, concepts like language, right? So bring me the biggest cube. Bring me one that's a little smaller, but don't bring me the smallest, <laughs> right? Comparative language is something else that you might use uh, something like the pink tower to reinforce. It's also great because it's good for visual discrimination. So the biggest of the smallest is very easy to understand, but here is the second and the third. And when you put them right next to each other, you know, it's pretty clear, but if you came over and you're missing one in this order of a big stack, you might bring this cube over and say, is it here? Is it here? Even I, when we were putting the cubes together, when we were stacking it together for the show, uh, I had to think for a second because we were missing a cube toward the middle. It's like, is that go with the before or after this one? And that's practicing visual discrimination, uh, which, by the way, is also great for learning how to read. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you do something like the pink tower, you're also teaching reading skills uh, and uh, fine motor skills, which will be used for handwriting. So can I take this very tiny cube and balance it? Um, kids love this stuff. They're drawn to it. First playing kids and even adults. I mean, come on. Who doesn't want to play with some blocks like this? <laughs> but first playing kids love this because they have a sensitive, they're in a sensitive period for order. They love putting things in order. They love thinking about stacking them up. How many times have you seen your little one, you're under five, want to make rows of popsicle sticks or line up crayons or maybe order them from biggest to smallest, like which crayon is the shortest and which is the longest? They're doing that naturally. What Maria found, this is one of her great discoveries that this is a sensitive period for learning. And it's a vital period because they use that stuff to do all kinds of things like learn how to read. Yeah, they do. It, all of it kind of builds upon each other in the Montessori curriculum. It's, totally. That's why, um, that's why it was so hard for us to separate out the 10 core subject areas in the first place when we developed the curriculum. Um, David and I actually had long discussions about whether or not geometry was going to be its own section in the primary curriculum or not. Yeah. Um, and I was arguing very strongly that, you know, it just has to remain sensorial, you know, even totally. though these are obviously going to lead to geometrical discoveries. That's right. Um, that's just such a core part of the primary program. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's really cool. And that, again, uh, that goes to the holistic nature 
of that kind of cosmic education that we talk about with Montessori, there is this one material, you know, and it's a core material. It's iconic. It really hits all the classics, isolation of uh, quality and all the sort of fun things that you do with it. But it actually is like a key that unlocks a whole world of things. It's so simple and yet so powerful. And it draws us to it uh, because of that, because of this natural desire to sort of manipulate and, and touch and play and stack these cubes. So it's a great one. And it's an, it's a classic for a reason. Yeah. Oh, so there's so much that you can learn from the pink tower. Should we talk about the present, the presentation? Yeah. So how would you give of, a lesson with that? I, this is where my yeah. knowledge is going to, <laughs> and I understand the conceptual, but teach me, how would I give a lesson? Okay. So, um, Oh, yes. Andrea also asked, hi, does it matter how they play with it? Yeah. So let's dig into yeah, that. Let's, let's actually practical. talk about practical what, you know, so you've invested in a pink tower. What do you do? All right. You can go online and watch. I'll tell you, there are a million different YouTube videos of other people giving the presentation, but I'm just going to kind of sum it up and we'll kind of just simplify it a little bit. All right. So the pink tower, it is special because it is a beautiful Montessori material. David just talked all about like the, the qualities that make it special. You know, it's mathematically exact. Um, the, the color is consistent. You know, it doesn't look like any other toy that you probably see online. Like it's its own special thing. It's such a unique pink. Yes. But let's think, you know, in, in terms of how the child would be perceiving it or looking at it, it is simply a, a, a set of blocks, friends, right? It is, it is a set of blocks and your child is going to play with it like a set of blocks. Now, the beauty of the material is that the design of the material is going to encourage them to play with it in certain ways. They're going to make certain discoveries with this set of blocks because there are only a certain number of them as well, you know, as opposed to just like a giant set of unit blocks where you get a hundred different sizes and shapes together. The, the pink tower is going to encourage them to play with it in some very specific ways that might lead them to some interesting discoveries. So we know that as an adult, but their children don't know that. And mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter to them. You know, the, the pers purpose of the material will feel obvious to them once they get it in their hands. Okay. So say you just buy a pink tower. You want to know what is the classic presentation. It's pretty straightforward. You set up the pink tower from, you know, bottom to top, just like this. You set the tower out somewhere in your home. Um, can be anywhere. Uh, I would encourage you to set it in one place, you know, where your child would have to walk back and forth to it because we want to involve a little movement as well. So maybe you put the pink tower in one room and you put your rug in another room, you know, so there's going to be a little bit of movement encouraged. You go over to the pink tower and you're just going to pick up the teeniest, tiniest cube and you'll hold it as carefully in your hands as possible. Now, it doesn't matter, you know, some, there are some Montessorians that say you have to hold it exactly with three fingers like this to encourage that pincer grip. Um, some just say, you know, you can just hold it gently in your palm. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the the care that you are giving to carrying this material. So you're going to be treating it gently and lovingly. Pick it up carefully, hold it in your hand, whoever you like, and carry it gently to a rug. And then you're going to just set it down on a rug in a random place. And then you're going to go back to the tower. So this is you can probably see why I'm encouraging you to put the tower somewhere else other you like away from the area that you're actually going to be working with it because you've got this movement, right? So you're going to go back to the place where the pink tower is. And then you're going to pick up the second cube and very carefully bring it over to a rug and you're going to set it down somewhere on that rug scattered kind of randomly in another place. You're going to do this until all of these cubes have been taken from the tower that was built onto the rug scattered out of order. And then you're going to build the tower up from the bottom to the top. So you'll find the largest and you're, you know, you're doing this mostly without talking. You're just letting your fingers do the showing and you're not necessarily talking. Do we need to plug in? Okay. <laughs> Let's grab that. Live show comes to an abrupt end because of electricity. <laughs> because we forgot <laughs> to plug in my laptop. Okay. So, 
So then you, you've got all your pieces on the rug and you just build your tower up from the top, from the bottom to the top, just to make the tower. And then when you're finished, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to take your tower and you're going to, you're, you're going to place these pieces from that tower back onto the rug. Uh, and then you're going to return it, you know, to its original position. So you're just showing your child really like how to go and get something, carry it super carefully across place it on a rug, explore it, play with it, have fun with it. Um, I think a, a good rule of thumb for introducing any new material to your child is to designate an area that where it belongs. The only thing about the pink tower to really consider is that these teeny tiny little cubes often get lost. So if yours rolls under the couch, um, don't feel like <laughs> don't feel like you're a bad person because you weren't able to keep in touch, you know, keep your your pink tower pieces <laughs> intact. This happens to classroom teachers all the time. They are replaceable. You can usually uh, if you buy a, a set of pink tower cubes, it usually it'll come with a couple extra little teeny tiny cubes. And if not, you can just order them. They do get lost very easily. But keeping your work on a rug, just on that designated space, is going to keep that from, you know, it's going to be less likely that you're going to lose your tiny pink tower pieces. All right. I, um, I think that at that point, you know, after showing your child, you know, what to do with it, then you know, the world is your child's oyster and they're going to make all of these comparisons. They're, you know, they're not going to build it probably perfectly. You know, they're going to build it out of order at first if you present it while your child is young enough to still be working on that visual discrimination, they won't get it right the first time. If your child already has the visual discrimination skills to build it, then they're already past that first step. They, you know, they, that part won't be interesting to them. They'll already be able to build up a pink tower. And to be honest, many children already have that kind of experience because they're used to playing with nesting blocks mm -hmm. or you know, there are other toys that teach visual discrimination, even if they aren't as lovely as the pink tower. That's right. So if your child has had those kind of experiences already, they might be thinking, ah, oh, what's the point of this? You know, I, I can build the tower and maybe they can and you know, okay. My child can already do that. But there's so much more that you could do with the pink tower. You can make designs with them. You can take the, the biggest and line them up kind of corner to corner mm -hmm. across your rug and make a diagonal. Um, oh, I have yeah. seen people make swirls with the yeah. pink tower. So like a spiral, start with the, the teeniest, tiniest cube in the middle and then, you know, swirl the cubes outward from the smallest to the biggest. It might remind you of a galaxy. Mm -hmm. Bring in a little more of that cosmic education, <laughs> the sensorial impression of it. Um, you know, so, you know, and your child will probably want to try and build it upside down. This does happen. Um, just a word of caution on that one. I think it's fine. Your child will find out that it's not steady, <laughs> you know, so yeah. you could try it on a, a stronger surface than a rug, like a hard surface. You can encourage mm -hmm, that. Book, um, and I would down. be there to support them, you know, because the tower is probably going to fall. And just to know your pink tower is going to get chipped. They almost all do. Even mine, which I have um, cared for gently <laughs> <It's> <laughs> That's right. for, for several years. I mean, they just all get chipped. Um, so I have yet to find a Montessori material company that makes a pink tower where the corners don't get chipped. Um, it's a big discussion online, whether it's a quality uh, control of, you know, for the companies, um, cause obviously there are toys out there that don't chip so easily, right. but just so you know, even if you buy a Montessori pink tower from a good company, you're, it's gonna, corners are just gonna get some wear and tear on them. And I just think that that is going to be evidence that your pink tower is being used. Yeah, being it's loved. evidence of love. It is. Now, in a Montessori <laughs> classroom, every Montessori teacher or guide gets to decide how they want the children to interact with the materials. In most Montessori classrooms, it is perfectly fine to combine materials together. So you might have yeah. the brown stairs yeah, so and you, the pink tower. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, or the red rods or, you know, other sensorial materials. And in fact, a lot of them do kind of fit together mathematically, yeah. which is something that your child can discover if you have invested in a variety of the sensorial Montessori materials. 
Yeah. And your child also is probably going to be making discoveries um, around your house as well. They're going to find that like this fits perfectly, you know, inside the corner of one of your bookshelves with some, you know, it could be used as like <laughs> a, bookend or <laughs> a bookend or, you know, maybe they realize that one of their other toys, you know, fits one of these cubes perfectly. Um, and these are all just discoveries for the child to make. And you would um, say it's not, it doesn't, so to that question, Andrea's question, yeah. doesn't matter how they play with it, it really doesn't as long as they have as, respect for the materials. Absolutely. And um, so we say like, as long if they are being destructive with the pink tower, you know, like they're, they're using it to hurt another person or to hurt themselves or to hurt something in the environment. Or maybe if they're being rough with it intentionally, maybe they're going to use it as a hammer or something, you might dissuade that. <laughs> So if they're, if I mean, it's a question, really. Yeah. So if they're being destructive with that, however you interpret that, you know, you're you're worried about something else being hurt. Um, your toddler is picking it up and throwing it at your four year old. Um, you know, those those are times to put the pink tower away. Well, this relates <laughs> you know, to, to the practical life yeah. uh, area of uh, grace and courtesy. Yes. Yes. Right? So, so, you know, you, you can teach your child how to be careful and kind with materials. Um, so in some sense, some parents choose to keep their Montessori materials in a special place away mm -hmm. from the regular toys. So that their child knows like, these are the toys that we can bang around and these are the toys that are really too expensive and nice <laughs> to bang around. Um, so there's that. Um, fantasy play happens you know i i personally i feel like children we don't not only do we live in a society where we encourage you know and really thrive through storytelling on our own i mean you think about adult culture a lot of what we do and how we live is based on stories and storytelling um from the commercials that you know maybe we watch from the kind of content that we digest the yeah. audiobooks you yeah. listen to or just stories that you read um the stories that we tell each other about our days. So of course your child is going to be immersed in some kind of role play or pretend play sometime in their young childhood. And it really usually blossoms during these primary years. Right. And so a lot of parents will look at these Montessori materials and think, okay, so these materials are for reality play. They're not for fantasy play. So I need to prevent my child from playing with them in a fantastical way. Um, and there are Montessori teachers who would agree with that ideology and would enforce it, like no fantasy play with the Montessori mm -hmm. materials. I am 100% against that ideology. Yeah. I think that we, as long as our children are being gentle and loving with their materials, we should let them play with them in the way that they want to. Right. So if in a Montessori classroom, what's available to explore that pink tower with is other Montessori sensorial materials or other materials on the shelf. And what's available at your child's home to explore other materials with are like Barbies or dollhouse or, or cars, dolls or cars, or like, um, then, then that should be available to them, you know, as long as they're being gentle and, and kind. Yeah, that's right. I can yeah. imagine a child who is, I was, I loved Brio trains when I was a kid and I could imagine a child wanting to stack this and then put the track from one to the other to see how fast the train or a marble would go down it and then using different sizes to sort of evaluate that. So you can do all kinds of fun stuff. And that imaginative play is totally fine because the beauty of these materials is that baked into the design is the lesson. That's what makes one of the things that makes Montessori so genius. So we're, we only have about five minutes left. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, <laughs> thank you, Libby. That's a <laughs> beautiful little testimonial there. Um, the pink tower is great. Is it a necessity? And is there anything you can use an as an alternative? So I would say as an alternative, sure, there's lots of things. There's the pink tower itself is is pretty cool, but Russian nesting dolls uh, uh, or nesting blocks, measuring cups. If you have measuring cups that get gradually smaller and you can put inside uh, one versus the other, they're demonstrating similar concepts, right? This idea of gradation of size and the stacking. Uh, these will convey a similar idea or... Uh, Go out, uh, you're out at the beach or you're out taking a walk. Uh, here at, here in um, here in San Francisco, it seems like everywhere we go, somebody has made a tower of rocks yeah. or a hundred or so towers of rocks on a beach. And they just have gone out and they found 
rocks of various sizes from largest to smallest. And some of these are very, very tall. This is actually something that we suggested our members in Constellation do. It's really fun. Constellation because, and, so, and that is teaching the same concept. And, the, you know, it's not yes. children doing that. It's adults. Uh, maybe still adults with children doing it because we love, like, stacking things and seeing Jenga towers or whatever, right? So absolutely, there are alternatives because what you're trying to teach your child is lessons about size and how big things can be heavier and small things can be lighter mm -hmm. or how many of a little thing can fit inside of a big thing or um, comparative language. Like, can you bring me the biggest measuring cup or the biggest rock? Mm -hmm. Or uh, if you're practicing uh, with grammar, grammar lessons, you know, you hide, can hide things around uh, reading, writing and grammar lessons. You hide objects around and you say, can you go get me uh, this or that? Uh, and it could be, go get me the very largest rock or the, in this case, the very largest uh, block. You don't have to have a pink tower to do that, but would you say owning a pink tower is a good use of your money? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I so would. Why? Because it's going to make you feel like a Montessorian. Like uh, just owning a pink tower, you're going to feel like you're part of the Montessori mm -hmm. club right away. Um, and they're actually not as expensive as they used to be. That's right. Yeah, there are much more affordable versions. You know, back when we had our children, um, when we had our first child, it was 15 years ago. And even, um, even then, it was most Mostly uh, made for schools. Mostly and made for schools. And now they have, they usually often have several versions. They'll have like a premium line where it's made out of hard wood and they'll have like a, a, a more affordable option for families. It's made out of maybe a more sustainable wood, like rubber wood. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not as durable. You can expect it. Might not have it. the heft. Might not have the heft. Yeah. The but, wood, but I, you know, I think that those things are negligible. You know, if it uh, gets a Montessori material into someone's home, I think that's great. So if you don't have the money for it, don't feel like you're lacking. I you mean, can just, do Montessori. Yeah, you totally can. Go get some rocks, like David said, of various sizes. Get your measuring get cups your, out. Yeah, get it's your measuring cups. Nice. It is perfectly okay not to own one. But owning one, I think, is really sweet and really special. And kind of, you know, it, pink is the symbol of love, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so, I don't know. I love the tower. Yeah, <laughs> and I think you'll a, fall in a, love with it as I, well. I agree. It definitely is a worthy investment. It will make you feel like a... Um, a real Montessori, and, and I would I would encourage you uh, just as you to underline what you're saying. Uh, let them play with it. Yes. It's okay. Don't buy it and fetishize it like it has to stay up high. Put it somewhere where the children can go and explore and play with it, and they're going to yeah. scuff it. They're going to drop it. They're going to misuse it from time to time. You're going to get chips. That's okay. Yes, and to, to underscore, um, the fussier you are with your pink tower presentation, you know the 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 more uptight you are about how your child is engaging with it and playing with it, or how often they're playing with it, the the more your child is going to resist and not want to play with That's it. That's right. Remember, so approach it like any other toy, or or like mm -hmm. as a gift you're giving your child. Like here, this is for you. I wonder what you can do with it, and what you can teach me to do with. What it. is the saying? Play is the work of yeah. the child. Put it out. Let the child play with it. They're working, especially in those young years in that sensitive period. Yes. Uh, for order and weight and, and all, so, and all sorts if of you, stuff. And um, if you buy a pink tower and it arrives in a box for Christmas, um, it's okay like to open it up together um, or birthday or whatever it is. It's okay to open it up together and explore it. You don't have to wait for the perfect moment to give the perfect lesson. Yep. The, the magic is already built into the material. Like it's already a great material and your child is intuitively very likely <laughs> intuitively going to know that it's like or discover that it's a tower. It is. So it's great to give the lesson if your child wants, you know, it is in the mind frame of having a lesson. It's, it can be a beautiful thing. Um, it is very long. Not every child wants to sit through it with their parents, even if they will sit through it with a guide. Mm -hmm. So the more you can relax and just love it and explore it and, and play with it and have fun with it, the better. That's right. Pink tower should have a BOGO sale. That is right. It is so <laughs> true. I mean, uh, we, we love playing with blocks. Even adults love, yeah. you know, uh, we say since the sensorial and the practical life uh, are really focused on the uh, five and under six and under first playing kids. But that's just because that they have a real sensitivity for it. Everybody, even a full grown adult 
loves exploring the world, interacting it in a sensorial way. This block feels really cool in your hand. It feels so good. Or like uh, laying under a weighted blanket. You know, it's kind of the same thing, uh, you, that sensorial experience. And so when you have a material like the pink towel, you're giving your children a chance to sort of isolate in on that. So we don't, I think we're about out of time. I yep. just want to see if there's any questions out there. Yeah, if you have a question, please put them in the chat. You're also welcome to email us directly, hello at childoftheredwoods.com. Yeah, you can leave a comment on this video. Yeah. And in uh, the tradition of YouTube videos. Like, subscribe. Like and subscribe. Whatever. It actually Do all really, the things. really helps our <laughs> channel. <laughs> so I've been heard. Um, so we would appreciate that. That's right. And if you're interested in this, it'll be available for replay. You can also get it as a podcast in a few days. Just subscribe to our Child of the Redwoods podcast. Uh, those are going to come out every Friday. We're going to be doing this every Tuesday. So for those of yep. you who are fans and are following and a <laughs> Child of the Redwoods Live, you're going to be able to see us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific right here. And again, if you're interested in that list, it's childoftheredwoods.com slash free. And then scroll down and you can get that. It's 21 essential materials. It includes a summary of some of the stuff we just talked about. Do you recommend one pink tower brand over another? And why is there a tower stand? And why is there a tower stand? Oh, you know, a pink tower stand. I used a little golden box for ours that we um, had got a Christmas gift in, yeah. I think, one year. So I never, we never actually had a stand at our house for our pink tower. It's just a, a, a nice place to be able to display it, you know, to kind of prop it up. So it's not necessary at all. Um, sometimes it can kind of feel a little weird to put your biggest pink tower cube directly on the floor, especially if floor gets dirty and stuff. So it can kind of raise it up a little bit. Um, we, we literally just used a little gold box that yeah. was uh, just, just bigger than the pink tower. Um, yeah. I liked it because it showed kind of showed it off. It's a pretty little box. Don't, and... Don't feel like you have to keep it. If you're a homeschooling parent, don't feel like you have to keep it in tower form. Uh, it, it is just as effective if you just lay it on the shelf or even put it in a basket. Um, I know it's type, it's kind of Montessori heresy, I guess, to <laughs> display it in a different way. But I actually walked into a Montessori classroom where I saw the Montessori pink tower displayed horizontally. Whatever so is the best for it's, you and it's your family works. is what, is, what <laughs> yeah, we would advocate. Whatever works. Um, and as far as a particular brand over one other, I don't have any recommendations. We, I have played with and tried out many different brands. Um, I, I would go for as high quality as you can afford. Mm -hmm. So if you can afford the premium version, you know, if it's really going to be something that you're just really going to love on and it's special to you, yeah, maybe you have a, yeah, a maybe a, it's worth a bunch of kids the extra that you want to go through and you want it to hold up over, yeah. you know, we know some of our community members have, you know, five or six children. You, it's a lot of kids to be playing with those blocks. So the higher quality, the potentially the longer lasting. Uh, but uh, if, you know, if you'd have a smaller family or, uh, you know, maybe you're already kind of toward the end and it's really more for uh, to have and to look at, then I think you could probably spend less. It's just whatever's right for your family is is what's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> the orthodoxy is, is about <laughs> as hard as that. That's about uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, friends, for spending time with us today. And we'll see you next week at 1 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. That's right. On Tuesdays. That's right. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank take you. Care. Take care.